Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. It's so wonderful to be here with all of you, um, both in person, like, whoo, in person, um, yay, um, and online. Even if you're not in the room, we really, really do feel your presence and send you a whole lot of love. Um, it is such an auspicious weekend. It is the incredible Sholem Justice Shabbat the Shabbat where we celebrate the incredible justice work of this community and highlight the power and responsibility that we hold as a Jewish family that's working together with lots of people to try to make this city and this world a better place. Tonight we are going to get to learn from our speaker, Dr. David Ansel. Um, we are so honored and delighted and excited to have you on our Bima teaching us tonight at Temple Shalom. So thank you for being here. I love that it is both Dr. Martin Luther King weekend and the beginning or this Sunday will be the beginning of Tu B'Shvat. Tu B'Shvat is the Jewish holiday that celebrates uh, trees and nature and asks us to pay attention to the exquisite beauty of our planet. And we often ask, why is Tu B'Shvat, why does it fall for us in the dead of winter? Like, why are we celebrating putting Earth Day at a time when it's like, you know, barely 20 degrees outside? It's like a balmy 40 miraculously in Chicago. The rabbis tell us that Tu B'Shvat takes place at this time of year because they believed that this was the time that sap begins to move upwards in trees. They were rabbis, not, you know, ecologists. So I don't know if they were right, but <laughs> that's what they said. Um, and they took a beautiful lesson from that idea that we celebrate the earth at not when it's in its most obvious flourishing state, but at a, during a time of change. I love to be reminded of this lesson, this Tu B'Shvat and this Malke weekend, because it's a reminder that sometimes on the outside, the world looks cold and bleak and unchanging. It looks and feels sometimes like we are not doing enough. We are not successful enough in working towards Dr. Martin Luther King's dream of racial equality. But Tu B'Shvat reminds us that there is a kind of change that is not always obvious to our eyes. We can't always see it directly in front of us. Sometimes it's the kind of change that happens a little bit slowly beneath the surface. And it's the real change that is required for that beautiful, obvious blossoming change to take place. And so that's the change that we're trying to be part of this Shabbat, this Sholem Justice Shabbat the slow change that happens beneath the surface so that what can really need to take place in Chicago will actually happen and will make a different reality for people living in this world. So let's work towards that. Let's pray for that. Let's learn for that, this Tu Bishvat, this Shabbat. We turn to our candle blessing where we bring light in the world and we invite up the DeWitt family um, Maya is celebrating her bat mitzvah this weekend. We invite up Merit, Adam, Abby, and Chase, and Maya. We're on page 120.
invite Maya to lead us in the Kiddush and the blessing over the wine. We are on page 123. <laughs> Maya. I got the honor of working on Maya's Devar Torah with her, and it's incredible. It's a real reminder that you don't have to be old to have really deep thoughts on God. Um, so we're very excited for you. We turn to page 138 for Lecha Dodi, for our prayer that celebrates and welcomes in, welcomes in Shabbat. Lecha Dodi
Shalom Alechem is our prayer that helps us imagine that there are angels in every home tonight saying, it's Shabbat, relax, take a breath, do what you need to do to be present in this moment. We're on page 142. <laughs> to read us in an inspirational reading about justice that our service is going to be, um, that are going, we're going to have several readings that are woven into our service tonight from the Shalom Justice team. Yeah. An excerpt from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Nobel Prize acceptance speech from December 10th, 1964. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that the unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word, word in reality. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity, equality, and freedom for their spirits. I believe that what, what self-centered men have torn down men other-centered can build up. I still believe that we shall overcome. Thank you. We rise for the Baruchu for our call to prayer, and we are on page 146. Hi, 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 hi. as we turn to the Shema on page 152.
Please be seated. And that we invite Brad Gordon to lead us in our next reading. These words are from uh, Rabbi Jack Stern, Jr. Mine was the opportunity to travel to Mississippi in 1964 at the peak of the civil rights struggle and to witness hum the human spirit striving to be free. I saw a police state. I saw signs, the battered faces beaten by white women, white policemen. I saw the charred pieces of a cross. I saw the rubble of a church burned to the ground and I was filled with anger. But I found something else too. I saw people longing to leave Egypt. We attended a freedom sing. According to the usual custom, the group formed a circle and sang, we shall overcome. One of the verses I had never heard before, God is on our side. Deep in my heart, I do believe God is on our side. The same God who was with us when we marched out of Egypt was with them in Mississippi. And is with us now. Thank you. So when Rabbi Singer was telling you in the beginning of the service all the various things that are happening, what a big night it is, you know, we didn't want to overwhelm you and throw too much at you at once. But there's also another big thing that's happening. It is, I like to think of it as the cantor's delight. It's, it's Shabbat Shirah. No, it's not my Sabbath. It's, a, it's everywhere. It's Shabbat Shirah. So that means that cantors or rabbis all across this country and all around the world are going to be reading from Parsha, Mashallah. And this is where our text of Micha Mocha directly comes from this. And so it's a, it's a very special night as we celebrate, um, you know, these beautiful words that we were gifted in our Torah. So I wanted to do a Micha Mocha that, you know, rose to the occasion. So I thought tonight we would do what um, the original Cantor Ben David's, one of his favorite Micha Mochas, uh, my father loves this. So we're going to try it. And um, all you have to do is clap your hands, look happy under your mask. Okay? I can tell if you're smiling, just so you know. All right, you ready? Let's cross the sea. Adonai Loch, 
that we're across, we turn to page 160 for Hashki Venu, our prayer where we ask for protection, um, for peace, and for being held um, in the presence of God. Hashki Venu Adonai Eloheinu Leshalom Leshalom Lehamli Venu Shomreinu lechaim. Ufrot aleinu to catch lo mecha. Ufrot aleinu to catch lo mecha. Amen. Shelter us beneath your wings. Shelter us beneath your wings, O oh Adonai. O oh, Adonai, guard us from all harmful things. O oh, Adonai, keep us safe throughout the night till we wake with morning light. Teach us the wrong from right. Amen. Join me on Amen. 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 Hashki venu Adonai Eloheinu leshalom, leshalom, lehamli venu. We rise in body and in spirit and turn to our Amidah on page 166. <laughs> Na 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 na, who be a gay? Who be a gay? Teddy Latter. Na 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 na, Hallelujah. <laughs> 
We invite up Sydney Coran for a reading before our silent prayer. Um, Sydney is the social justice chair for Or Shalom, our high school youth group. We cannot merely pray. We cannot merely pray to God to end war, for the world was made in such a way that we must find our own path of peace within ourselves and with our neighbors. We cannot merely pray to God to root out prejudice, for we already have eyes with which to see the good in all people if we would only use them rightly. We cannot merely pray to God to end starvation, for we already have the resources with which to feed the entire world if we would only use them wisely. We cannot merely pray to God to end despair, despair, for we already have the power to clear away slums and give hope if we would only use our power justly. We cannot merely pray to God to end disease, for we already have great minds with which to search out cures and healings if we would only use them constructively. Therefore, we pray instead for strength, determination, and willpower. To do instead of merely pray, to become instead of to merely to wish that our world may be safe and that our lives may be blessed. Adapted, adapted from Jack Reedman. Amen. We take a moment now for quiet, for personal ref reflection, for prayer. If you're standing, when you're done, you can be seated. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, oh, hey yo, hey yo, oh, hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, oh, hey yo, hey yo, oh, yeah, oh, shalom. us just like Sydney said we don't have to pray to God for it we just got to do it ready soon there will be peace among us soon there will be peace among us soon there will be peace among us peace for us all 
So many people right now who feel broken, who are going through a hard time. We may be one of those people, one of the people who could use Amisha Bera, who could use um, just a feeling of hope and strength. So we name out loud people who we're thinking of, people who we're praying for. Um, if there's someone who you're thinking of and you'd like to share their name out loud, I'll pass my hand around the room and you can share their name. Um, and then Rabbi Gelman will share the names of people who have been submitted by our community who's joining us online. from our congregation joining us on, online. Anna Sikorsky, Marge Hilliard, Greg Sessler, Bob Blanford, Marianne and Rick, Debbie Miller, Jeanette, Caleb, Sarah Golub, Anne, Janine and Dennis, Cheryl Tanita, Bob Reisman, Avner Drucker, Esther Docarter, Dee Dee Cohen, Taryn Vaughn, Queen Aquila Franks, Reginald Johnson, Beatrice David, Adrian Rosenberg, Sarah Golub, Louise Chapman, Anthony Barnes, Mary Spriggs, Tom Spriggs, Heidi Habs, Cookie Marks, Thelma Stills, Max Cohn, Leanna Edwards, Gordon Campbell, Winifred Halsey, Sandy Neville, Marcella, Marcella Wilson and family, Cindy Weinzerl, Daniel Weinzerl, Joan Stockhoff, Flo Bernberg and Susan Levine, Marty Gersman, Tammy Mormino, Louis Venegas, Eric Levin and Sharon Tarnoff, Martha Lessman, Katz, Hank Lerner and Spence Marks, Jan Albers and Carl Young Youngdahl, Debbie Willage and Lori Deitz, Jeanette Ponder, Johnny Reichertzer, Marion Kramer, Leah Loving, and Susan Levines, Rick Feldman, Nina Silverstein, Siggy Frankel, Jim Clemens, Barbara and David Sussman, Pam Zolnay, the Kelly family, Sophia and Joel, Joel Finkel, Anna Kaplan, Teresa Dassinger, Norma Cotton Taylor, David Schaub, Brandon Howes, Phil Dunn, Jonathan Spitz, Elaine Baddock, Barry Ferris, Javier Escalante, Jody Titner, Barbara Durst, and Maxine Durst, Beverly Gibbons, Luis Venegas, and Susan Sullivan, Paula Serralo, Trevor Bell and family, Eric Levin, Sharon Tarnoff, Ira Levinson, Michael Bade, Tom Duhigg, Tom Bort Boritsky, Linda Boritsky, Phil Block, Lee Schlesinger, Miriam Amund Foreman, Natasha Stoller, Juju Line, Michael Damon, Debbie Damon, Bart Barish, Candy Roller, Caleb, June, and Dan, Larry Kamler, and Ira Levinson. Mm -hmm. 
Once there was a man walking along the beach and he saw a woman far away and she was moving kind of oddly along the seashore. At first he thought she was dancing, but then he soon realized what she was doing. She was going along the seashore, picking up a starfish and throwing it in the water. He asked her, what are you doing? The woman said, the tide is low and unless I put these starfish back in the water, they are surely going to die. The poet responded, or the man responded, there are millions of miles of beaches, thousands and thousands of starfish. You can't possibly make a difference. With that, the woman leaned forward, picked up a starfish and threw it back into the water. It made a difference for that one, she said. In this week's Torah portion, we experience the exodus from Egypt. Though, according to our tradition, this happened to a certain group of people a very long time ago, each one of us continually learns and grows from this story of the exodus. We recall every year around this time when we read it in the Torah and during Passover, what it means to be slaves in Egypt. We recall what it meant to live in inequality. We recall what happens when you stand up for what is right. On this Sholem Justice Shabbat, marking Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, we take it as a moment to continually, continually recommit to being an active part in making our world a more equitable place for each and every person. And to help us continue to see our world for the ways that we can help it be that more equitable place. To help introduce our distinguished speaker, I'll have you start making your way up, Wendy. I get to introduce our own Dr. Wendy Brown. She is the former chief of staff at the Jesse Brown VA Medical Center, and now serves as the co-chair of Temple Sholem's COVID-19 Health and Safety Task Force, which Wendy, I have to say, is that a, that's gotta be a move up. That's a promotion, right? Yeah, okay, we'll go with that. Didn't realize quite how much it was gonna be until we <laughs> <laughs> Didn't realize how much it was going to be. Well, we're so thankful for you and all that Thank you, you do for us. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. David Ansel, who's our speaker. Dr. Ansel came to Chicago in 1978 to do a three-year residency as what I call the real Cook County, not Schroger. This preceded Schroger. I actually did part of my internship at Cook County also, a few years before Dr. Ansel. He spent he had intended to spend three years there and he spent 17. After that, he went to Mount Sinai and spent 10 years there. And then 2005, he went to Rush as chief medical officer. 
That was in 2005. In 2006, I moved back to Chicago to become chief of staff at Jesse Brown, and that's how we met. Um, he has written two books. I've written both. I've read both of them, and I strongly recommend it. His current title is Senior Vice President and Associate Provost for Community Health Equity, which has been a lifelong area of interest for him. Now, he's going to talk to us a little bit about that. I strongly recommend you read his book, The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills. And um, Maddie and I will be hosting a Zoom meeting on February 10th to discuss the book. You're all welcome to attend whether you've read the book or not. I think there's a lot going on. And then on Tuesday, February 22nd, we will have the pleasure of an hour long Zoom call with Dr. Ansel. Dr. Ansel. Good evening, everybody. That was a really terrific introduction. My father would have loved it. And my mother would have believed it. But I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi, Cantor, you have a beautiful voice. Uh, you made my evening. Uh, thank you. When I was asked to give a 10 minute sermon here tonight. I consulted my rabbi, Max Weiss of Oak Park Temple. He said, 10 minutes? That's barely enough time to put the temple president to sleep. But I'm, I'm pleased to be here and, and say some words. My, my presence here tonight is actually a matter of chance my grandparents were 19 and 20 when they made a snap decision, each one individually, to abandon Europe and religious persecution. But they could only leave Poland under the condition of marriage. Grandma walked into a room of men and wondered which one she was assigned to marry. It didn't much matter. My grandfather was her ticket out of Poland. My European family was exterminated in the Holocaust. My grandparents' teenage impulse to escape allows me to stand here tonight. And because of that, my uh, work has always focused on uh, justice, social justice, and human rights. 45 years ago, Dr. Brown mentioned, I arrived to the west side of Chicago to big medical training at Cook County Hospital. I know what you're thinking. He looks so young. The once vibrant West Side never recovered from years of exploitation, capital, and business abandonment. Stores, uh, big businesses, Maybelline, Brock, Zenith, Western Electric, Sears left, and hundreds of businesses were torched uh, after in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination. And uh, there's really not been a lot of redevelopment since then. Incomes on the West Side since 1970 have plummeted uh, while in contributing to the concentration, concentrated disadvantage and segregation we have today. During the same period, wealth in the, the, this neighborhood and the lakefront neighbors of Chicago skyrocketed, widening the divide that we have in the city between rich and poor and black and white. Actually, a story told all across the country. It's one thing to be deprived as wealth, uh, as a physician who's observed these situations. It's another thing to die prematurely as a result. I practice uh, on the west side along Ogden Avenue, uh, an old uh, Native American path at Cook County, Mount Sinai, and, and Rush. I call that one street, two worlds, two worlds of health, two worlds of health care. And my 40 years plus of practice at County uh, Sinai, 30 years, not one patient who needed it received a life-saving organ transplant. And so I and my colleagues would watch our patients die 
from end organ failure. It was just not an option from them. One patient from Sinai, I remember Tommy, he was 21, a father of two toddlers. When he de developed a viral condition that weakened his heart, uh, his two brothers kept nighttime vigil at his bedside while he struggled for breath. And even though I was the chair of medicine at Mount Sinai, he was uninsured and I couldn't get him to a transplant center. And he died even though his age and condition would have catapulted him to the top of the transplant list. And that story is repeated over uh, and over again. So he died uh, of inequality, of an inequity. And yet the organs that cured the insured largely white people that the cities and regions transplant centers came from the black and brown bodies of patients in the ICUs. Uh, every year in Chicago, 3,500 excess black people die just because they do not have the same chance uh, as long life as white people. It's 9-11 of deaths every year. And yet we spend five trillion to go to war uh, and I have yet to put the kind of investments um, in, uh, into life itself in our city. But excess mortality is not just an issue of access to medical care, it's inequality in neighborhood conditions. I was chief medical officer at Rush, but I gave it up to focus uh, the rest of my career on this issue of uh, inequities. And I presented a map in 2016 to the board of Rush that showed life expectancy along the L track, something that people have heard a lot about now. If you live in this neighborhood, uh, you can live to the age of, nine, uh, of 85. And if this area of the lakefront were a country, it'd be ranked one first in the world in life expectancy, think Japan. But travel the blue line five or six miles to Pulaski and Garfield Park and life expectancy plummets to under 69, a 16 year gap. A 16 year old teenager, black young man in Garfield Park has a little bit more than a 50-50 chance to live to the age of 65. And when people hear that, they a lot of times they think violence and certainly gun violence is a problem uh, in the city. But more than 50% of the 9.2 year gap in life expectancy being blacks and whites in Chicago is due to chronic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, maternal infant health, uh, and the like. Uh, so yes, it's a form of violence, structural violence. Structural, because it's designed into our norms, our policies, our procedures, the way business occurs, and violence because people are put in harm's way uh, as a result. We met with community leaders after presenting this map with the board and said, what if we could do something together? Uh, and one of them was Pastor Marshall Hatch, uh, the pastor of New Mount Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church in West Garfield Park. Uh, and we showed him the map. And I sat at this table with, uh, with Pastor Hatch. Uh, and he looked at the life expecting and said, the Bible says the last shall be first. Uh, and the community members told us what they wanted. Healthy communities where families can thrive, the same thing that we all want. And together with community leaders and five other hospitals, we launched a racial uh, health equity collaborative that's still in existence called Westside United in 2018. And we asked the question, what if we could all come together, not just to improve the health outcomes, but to improve the social outcomes under which people uh, uh, live all across Chicago, but particularly in that neighborhood of West Garfield Park where Pastor Hatch has his church. And we set a bold, ambitious goal to slash that 16 year life expectancy gap in half by 2030. Then COVID-19 hit. COVID-19 rooted itself in the pre-existing racialized and economic faults that have already uh, divided our city. Chronic illnesses like heart disease and cancer uh, kill over decades, so we don't see it. But in COVID-19 revealed in a short time uh, the great gaps in our society. We, a tale of two cities. Uh, in a way, we are all biologically vulnerable. Uh, the human genome is, we're the same in all of us, is social vulnerability that decide, that determines uh, who lives uh, and dies. And it was personal. Pastor Hatch lost his sister and his best friend and many others in his church. And all, all I could reflect in my synagogue, we lost almost nobody. 
And, and so it's palpable in its absence and it's palpable in its presence. Black and Latino people were three times more likely to be hospitalized than whites and still are, and twice as likely to die uh, across the United States. And black and Latino men lost three years of life expectancy in 2020 alone. Um, so COVID was, is a terrible uh, pandemic, but it's more terrible to some than others. Of the first 100 deaths from COVID in the city of Chicago, 70% of them were in black people. And the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot said, it took my breath away. She understood disparities existed, but she didn't understand in her gut uh, how uh, urgent uh, the situation was till this happened. And she huddled with her staff, said, give me some things that we can do. And she, they gave her some things. She said, that's not good enough call Westside United. And one Sunday in April, 2020, we had a phone call uh, with the staff and said, it's gotta be, you have to have a community response that's as robust as the hospital response. We needed a surge, rent relief, food, uh, com uh, computers, Wi-Fi, uh, all of the things to make life sustainable, masks. And we set up a command center with the city of Chicago, with the uh, Westside United, with community voice, with the hospitals and the clinics, uh, as an emergency command center and was called the Racial Equity Rapid Response Team. Uh, and we began an effort to be hyper-local and follow the pandemic in the community to deprive the kind of social relief uh, that uh, folks need. It's hard when you have all this pre-existing uh, burden of disease, but we think we made uh, a difference. And that community voice around the table is critical. Democracy is not just about voting every four years. Democracy is about the authentic voice of the community, making decisions in real time. And really for the first time in many years in the city history, this, the community voice uh, was, uh, had the ear of the mayor's office. And despite the bru uh, brutal disproportionality of the pandemic, Chicago fared better than many cities uh, because we had equity, justice, and community voice at the center of the COVID response and still do today. Third in population, seventh in mortality, still a brutal disease, still disproportional, a lot more to do, but we think we made a difference by this uh, racial equity framing. As a white man, as a Jew, whose family faced genocide and whose been career has been dedicated to health equity, it took me many years to publicly acknowledge racism and economic deprivation as root causes for the poor health of my patients in my neighborhood. And I had to do a little bit of a root cause analysis on myself. Why didn't I publicly talk about racism? Um, and because the status quo has been beneficial for me, doors open for me. I got to sit around decision-making tables, largely with people who look like me, uh, tables that have been closed to others. And I benefited from the fact that my gender and skin pigment have allowed me to soar professionally. It's not that I'm not talented but I had unearned advantage. And I realized I needed to publicly acknowledge, uh, and then other white leaders need to do that, that racism and poverty are root causes of death gaps. And this acknowledgement is a necessary first step uh, in making change. But we have to do a lot more than talk. It just doesn't need more study. We don't need more data. We don't need more reports. We don't need people who are surprised and shocked Every time uh, we see this, we need to take action uh, because shame on us if we don't. And I'm reminded of the words of Dr. King in 1967 uh, when he talked about uh, the uh, urgency of now, uh, the fierce urgency of now. So what if we all deeply cared about the outcomes in Garfield Park as we do about those in all of our other neighborhoods? If our destinies and the destinies of our children and grandchildren were bound to the destinies of children in Garfield Park. Five years ago, before we launched Westside United, I didn't know Pastor Hatch. I didn't know his wife, his son, his daughter, his beautiful uh, granddaughter, Sophia. I'd never walked in Garfield Park. Our lives in communi and communities, in the words of Dr. King, are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment. What a difference we can make if we just did more. I hope we can leave this Shabbat service and of course the social justice uh, folks here, I know this burns in you every day, with a sense of urgency to repair the longstanding 
injustices that divide our re, uh, region. We need a recommitment and not just a short-term recommitment. We need a long-term recommitment to social justice work. We need everyone to ask themselves, what can I do? Next thing, there has to be a contribution. People feel like oftentimes we're talking about financial contribution, but we're not just talking financial contribution. We're talking about time, talent, and resources. What kind of contribution can you make? And everyone has a contribution to make, no matter how small. And finally, a willingness to work. These problems are not easy, they're longstanding, but they, we have to be put in proximity to them, roll up our sleeves, uh, and a willingness to do the work, get dirty. We need time, talented resources and commitment and the willingness to work for all of us to come together so everyone can succeed and tra transform this uh, tale of two cities divided by racism and poverty uh, into one. So no one among, the, among us looks back and said, I should have done more. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I look forward on the 22nd uh, to speaking with you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ansel. And uh, though Rabbi Conover is not in our physical presence, uh, he has some words from Zoom. Well, Dr. Ansel, what you shared with us was sobering, but your challenge to us to us is inspiring. And I'll say that I, I I met you when I you know I met you many years ago when the Religious Action Center of Illinois was trying to figure out what was going to be our first step, what was going to be our first major issue, as we were looking at racial inequality in our city. And we went to you as one of our great experts, as well as friends, to be able to say, what about access, equal access and equitable access to healthcare? And you told us these stories, but you did so with other people with whom you were in relationship. And so in that way, you were modeling for us the way in which not only to see the problems as they are, but also find the solutions that we are very much capable of not only in the city, but in this larger society. And you in some ways remind me of Deborah from whom we hear in this week's uh, parasha in our Haftarah, where we hear that she says, you know what Israel really needs? It needs a mother. It needs the mother of Israel. And she said, I'll step forward. I am, um, I'm a judge and I'll also be able to take this way of deep concern about um, the society's children, as well as the kind of fierceness that a mother uses in order to be able to fight for what's right for her children. Well, Dr. Ansel, I say you model that beautifully and thank you for that. You teach us about our shared destiny. Uh, you teach us um, and truly live the words of Dr. King about the network of mutuality because you bring us into this big circle of concern and you show us the power that we have. And so I'm looking forward to meeting with you again on February 22nd, where you'll help us to find ways in which we as a synagogue can really approach some of the solutions to our cities and truly our entire society's challenges around it, um, really around um, unequal access to, to healthcare and, and truly the, the way in which uh, poverty and racism then determine unfairly people's longevity in life. I wanna say a special thank you to Dr. Wendy Brown, whose wisdom is appreciated in all ways, including being able to use this beautiful uh, connection to bring you to us, Dr. Ansel. So thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you for all that you do to help us to guide our policies around um, our COVID health and safety protocols. Thank you to Maddie Major and to Marla Gross, our co-chairs of Sholem Justice, who lead us with such wisdom and true, true kindness and concern. Uh, you inspire us, so thank you. 
Thank you to Toby Sanders, who is extraordinary in the ways in which you not only support this program, but provide vision for it. Thank you for all you do for justice, all you do to motivate us. And a very special thank you to Rabbi Scott Gelman, uh, who is our social justice guru at Temple Sholem. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for making sure that we bring to life the justice that is right there in our Hebrew Bible that says we must act. You help us to do that uh, with great, great success. And we know that there's great challenges to come. So thank you for continuing to lead us so well. So thank you so much. And I know from here, we have even more things to hear about that are coming up. But Rabbi Gelman, will you repeat again um, the, the different events that are happening with Dr. Ansel coming up in February? Yes. Thank you. So it is, uh, I don't have, uh, you actually, uh, it is actually February 22nd. Yeah, it is February 22nd. Um, but even before then, we're going to have, uh, this is the kind of kickoff to a book club on uh, the book, The Death Gap, uh, where we'll be gathering together via Zoom uh, to have a conversation about the book uh, in a number of weeks. And actually, Dr. Brown, I'm just going to grab this from you. There we go. You're the prepared one. Uh, February 10th at 6 p.m. on Zoom, uh, we're going to join together to have a conversation led by Dr. Brown and Dr. Major uh, to help us to, uh, to, to get ready for this, uh, the next discussion uh, with Dr. Ansel. Uh, and continuing the social justice uh, excitement of the, this weekend, um, on Sunday morning, our Adult Education Committee, co-sponsored with Sholem Justice, uh, is hosting Rabbi Rachel Mikva, uh, who will be talking about religious ideas about criminal justice reform uh, and exploring the ideas of justice in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And you can uh, join on that at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. On Saturday, we are having a gathering of our Mindful Jewish Aging group. Um, so if you like aging mindfully, please join them at 1 p.m. on tomorrow. Well, I'm going to mention a few things here. Echo Chabara is having a Tu Bishvat Seder. Enough. <laughs> Monday, January 17th at 7 p.m., so join them as they celebrate all of these ancient traditions of Tu B'Shvat. Next week on Friday at 6.15, we have Shabbat Mishpacha. Same thing, mixed presents. Hopefully a lot of you here and a lot of you online. Um, and do you want to talk about yeah. what sounds like, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm too old for this now, unfortunately, but <laughs> I would have been a lot of fun at it. I just oh, want absolutely. You to know. Yes, so uh, this upcoming Friday, our 20s and 30s group, Makom, is going to be gathering online for matzo ball soup Shabbat. Um, so we're going to be all making matzo ball soup together. And then we're going to be delivering it the next day to community members who could use extra nourishment. Um, so please come make matzo ball soup with us. Um, or if you aren't available, but you have a car, you can sign up to do deliveries. Uh, we would love to see you there. And um, in Coming up at the end of January, we have a Women of Temple Shalom speaker, Reva Lehrer, who is going to be speaking about her book, Go Gollum Girl, um, which she's an incredible artist, uh, disability activist, and writer. And we highly, highly recommend the book. The, and um, she's also speaking on a panel with the incredible Stacey Reichertzer and Karen Titus. So you got to be there. It's going to be online on Zoom, and we can't wait. Thank you. A lot of exciting, especially Shabbat things coming up. As we turn back to our prayer book on page 586, we find the prayer Aleinu. Literally, those, that word Aleinu means it's on us, reminding us 
that all that we hear tonight is upon us to do our duty in our world. On the bottom of page 586, we rise in body or in spirit. We may be seated as we prepare for the mourner's cottage. Each person, every person has a name. It's a poem by the Hebrew poet Zelda. We each have a name given by God and given by our father and our mother. We each have a name given by our stature and smile and given by our, our attire. We each have a name given by the hills and given by the walls. We each have a name given by the stars and given by our friends. We each have a name given by our sins and given by our yearnings. We each have a name given by our enemies and given by love. We each have a name given by celebrations and given by our work. We each have a name given by the seasons and given by our blindness. We each have a name given by the sea and given by our death. Tonight, our Temple Sholem community is thinking about those who have passed away in the last 30 days, Sylvia Stern and Jeffrey Shannon, and those whose yard sites are observed in this week now ending, Mercedes Abrams, Shell Baskin, Robert Berman, Sidney Burrs, Marjorie Brownie, David Cohn, Wayne Dale, Dr. William Zitkowski, Franchon Fran Ehrlich, Saul E. Feldbein, Jean Feldman, Abe Golub, Dr. Jacob A. Goodman, Larry Gordon, Kurt Gutman, Jean Pierre Gaskins, Jeanette Hondequin, Esther Huber, Elizabeth Jones, Abe Carnes, Lev Kodosh, Ray Kramer, Gussie Lasko, Francis Leventritt, Dr. Oscar Lisker, Edwin Litwin, Carol Kathleen Lawner, Helene Mann, Edna Miller, Barry Miller, Kalman Mintz, Marianne Louise Morris, Helen Narevsky, Israel Offer, Lillian Potashnik, Sheila Rosenblatt, Goldina Schwartz, Susan Sharp, or excuse me, Stuart Sharp, Gussie Slavinsky, Alfred Charles Stanley, Jerry Taylor, Joseph L. Tobin, Sidney Weinig, Libby Weinstein, and Ida Siegel Wolf. We'd like to add any names to our list of memory. I invite you to share them aloud. From those joining on Zoom. We add Ronald A. Sackheim, Betty White, Bob Kupler, Irving Newman, Terry Kaminsky, Sherry Tamiko Goodman, Sidney Poitier, Julie Lessman, Michael Cooper, Ruth Oppler, Sarah Hamilton, Joanne Bierman Black, Mary Kay Bradle, Sherry Tamiko Goodman, Leonard Smith, Bill Gass, Juliana Schaefer, Jack Schmutt, Howard Broderick, Liege Flutter, Mom Rosick, David Gunning, Terry Teachout, Helen Schneider of Stockton, California, Howard Vihan, Sandra Goincher, Michael Cooper, and James Jenden. As we together rise in body or in spirit, page 598. 
Yitadal, the Yitadash Shemiraba, the Almati Brach in the Malchuse, the Hayahon of Yomahon, the Haye, the whole Beit Israel, Bagalau is Mankari Binu. Amen. The Hishmeraba, the Horach, the Olamula, the Maya, the Barach, the Shabach, the Paar, the Roman, the Yitase, the Yitadar, the Talevi, Talal, Shmeb, Brisha. Ela Minho Vekatar Shirata, Tushbekata Nechamata, the Amiran Yama Binu. Amen. He Shlama Rabba Bin Shemaya, the Hayim Aleni of Holy Israel, Binu. Amen. We said Shalom the Roma. We are said Shalom. Aleni the of Holy Israel, Binu. Amen. Oh, said Shalom in Roma. We are the Shalom Aleinu, we are Holy Israel, Imu, Imu, Amen. You can be seated for just a moment and turn to page 652. I, I was singing and humming and we were playing this melody as you were entering the sanctuary as you came online. And so I think that all the wisdom that has been imparted to us tonight, these are the perfect words to, to really bookend this evening. So on 652, it says, you and I will change the world, you and I, and all will join us. Though it's been said before, it doesn't matter. You and I will change the world. You and I will start from the beginning. It may be difficult, but it doesn't matter. Ani viata nishane taona. Ani viata az yavo kvar kula. Amru et zekolem lefanai zelo mishane. Ani viata nishane taona. Ani veata menase me hatala. Yehi elanura ein davar zelo nora. Amru et zekodem lefanai zelo mishane. Ani veata nishane et haola. And the paraphrasing of Dr. Ansel and of the words of Brian Stevenson it is about getting proximate, it is about getting close, it is about being together. Anive Ata, you and I will change the world. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Maya DeWitt, you're going to change the world tomorrow and be our teacher. Mazel tov. Shabbat shalom. <laughs>